lift our hand and give him glory. We come to lift our hand and give him glory. Everybody say.
that we could not pay. And Lord, all we can do just say thank you.
That's one or two of us. Let's see if we can get three. Let's see if we can get three. Let, let's see if we can get four. Let, let's see if we can get five that God been good to. Oh, oh let's see if we can get a whole row that can say, he been good to me. I wonder what would happen if the whole church would say that the Lord been good to me. for you. Now, now, with the rest of Second Mount Olive, just stand briefly and let's give them, let's give them a hand clap. Let's give them a hand. Let's reach out and extend to them and let them know that they are welcome in this place. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of our God at the period of offering. If you'd be so kind as to slide that blue card into the offering vessel, it will allow us to contact you and to let you know what's going on around Second Mount Olive. Amen. All right. of your faith, we baptize you, Taya Marie Mingo, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. of your faith, I baptize you, Marcel Mingo, in the name of the Father, yeah. and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.
Check one, two. Hey man. Y'all hear me now? There we go. Thank you.
many they glad he got up. If you would rise and stand with me to the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 12. New Testament book of Acts. We are still in our study of the book of Acts and the study of God's church. If you meet me at Acts chapter 12, we'll begin at verse number 5. We'll read 5 through 7, skip down to verse number 11, and then we'll conclude at verse number 16. chapter 12 verse number 5 through 7 we'll skip down to verse number 11 and conclude at verse number 16 when you have it say I got it if you're still looking say wait for me I'm waiting Acts chapter 12 I'm reading from the New American Standard no matter what version you read it should sound like this. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Come down to verse number 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. And when he had realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where they were gathered together and were praying. And when he had knocked on the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in to announce that Peter was standing in front of the gate and they said to her you out of your mind but she kept insisting that it was so and that and they kept saying it is an angel but peter continued knocking and when they had opened the door they saw him and were amazed grass withers flower fades and the word of our god shall stand forever for the time that is ours to share together, uh, I want to speak from the thought of a fighting church. You may be seated in the presence of our God. To fight is to contend in combat with blows and weaponry. I know somebody's asking how does a story about prayer also fit a sermon about fighting? I'm glad you asked because when the church fights, it is by prayer. The New Testament, in the book of Corinthians, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not corner, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. The writer uh, concludes to us that 
when we fight, uh, we don't use nails and hammers and swords and bats, but when the believer fights, the fighting is not by our fists, but on our knees. I know I'm right about it. For when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he says that because we are in a fight, we are to put on the whole armor of God. That we might be able to stand against the fiery darts of the devil. He says we ought to put on the, 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 the breastplate of righteousness, the head of the helmet of salvation, to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, that our loins ought to be girded about with truth and the sword of the spirit by our side. He's letting us know that we are in a fight, but we can't fight like the world fights because we are his children and the church we fight when we learn how to pray there's somebody that's asking a church member I'm going through a trial and a tribulation and you keep calling me telling me I'm praying for you that's because you don't understand the power of prayer I'm not at my best when I got my fist up I'm my best when I'm on my knees with my hands lifted towards heaven. Whenever I pray, that's when I'm fighting. Pastor HP HP uh, at Pastor HB Charles writes a book entitled It Happened After Prayer. And in this book, he has a uh, provocative quote. And the quote is, uh, you cannot cancel your appointment with trouble. You, you can cancel your doctor's appointment. You can cancel your dentist's appointment. If you've got a business meeting, you can reschedule it. The courts will even allow you to reset your case so that it can be tried at a different date. But I wish I had two or three witnesses that could testify. If you got an appointment with trouble, then that's an appointment that you can't cancel. You can try to delay it. You can pray all you want. You can read your Bible. You better develop a prayer life because there are only three positions for the Christian. We are in trouble. We are out of trouble. Are we on our way to trouble? But in the midst of trouble, I've learned that prayer is how do I fight. In this text, uh, Peter is in prison because he loves the Lord. That, that, that is something that blows my mind. That Peter has not committed any crime. Peter has not done anything that would land him on death row. But Peter is awaiting execution because he decided to stand for the Lord Almighty. And I need to tell you, there's some people that ain't going to like you just because you got Jesus on your lips. They so tired of you talking about Jesus this and Jesus that and Jesus will make a way and Jesus will turn it around. They just want to put their hands around your neck and strangle you. And Peter is in prison because he loves the Lord. I need to tell you that because some of y'all done lost some friends and you trying to figure out what you done. No, it ain't the what, it's the who. Now that you living for Jesus and you got God on your side, there's some people that just can't hate At every stop, somebody else get off. We started with a full bus, but now that I've been riding with Jesus, it seems like every 
just stop. Somebody got to ring the bell and get off. I don't care if the bus is empty. I'm going to keep serving God. I wish I had two or three witnesses that made up their mind that when I'm fighting, I'm I want to show you a few things. I'll get out of your way. When you are a believer, prayer is your artillery. Prayer is your weapon. You ain't got to look for it. It's on the inside of your heart. When we met Peter before, he really began to walk with God. He was cutting off ears. But now Peter is committed to prayer. Are there any Peters here? Hey, Peter is somebody that has formerly put your foot in your mouth. But now you've grown to the point that you don't fight like you used to fight. Oh yeah, you used to call yourself a cussologist. But now you done stopped cussing and started praying. You used to be the queen of petty. But now you ain't petty no more. Because you learned how to pray. Instead of cussing people out, you learn how to shut your mouth and put it in the hands of God. The greatest battle you're going to fight is the battle to pray. Prayer is your artillery. Sometimes when you're reading a text, don't look at what they do. Look at what they do not do. Do. Note that when Peter was in prison, they didn't show or uh, throw a benefit for Peter's bail. Uh, they didn't do a barbecue for Peter's burial. They didn't go down and march around the prison seven times. The first thing they did was decided that we ought to pray. I wish I had a church that would stop making prayer an afterthought and make prayer the thought. The moment trouble shows up, you ought to get on your knees and begin to pray because prayer is your artillery. Uh, the text reveals there's an assumption of prayer. The Bible says Peter is in prison and the church was making prayer for him. It's assumed that if you are part of the church that uh, prayer ought to be a daily discipline. They didn't ask, did they pray? They immediately, at the first sign of trouble, started praying. Can I ask you, you are a part of the church, but is prayer your discipline? Do you have a prayer life? When you wake up in the morning, before you put anything in your mouth, do you open that mouth and say, Lord, I thank you. When you get ready to eat your lunch, before you taste one crumb, do you tell the Lord thank you? Before you lay your head down and begin to get sweet rest, do you tell the Lord thank you? There is an assumption of prayer. Am I wrong to believe that if you call yourself the church, then that means you got a prayer life? Am I wrong to, to believe that, that you ought to pray more than you work out and watch TV? Am I wrong to believe that when things start messing up in your life, that you've decided that prayer is your only way out? But, but watch this. Prayer. There's not just an assumption of prayer. There is agreement in prayer. Know that they are praying and the Bible says that they are praying for the same thing. That you don't have one person praying about this and one person praying about that. The Bible says they are praying that Peter going to get free. Uh, I just know that when you got more than two or three people, you always got somebody that got a different agenda. Somebody praying you live and somebody praying you die so they can have your space but note that the church has in agreement in prayer everybody praying for the same thing there's, there's, there's an assumption of prayer there's an agreement of prayer but then there's an assignment in prayer the Bible says 
They pray fervently. Uh, that means the prayer is two things. It's constant and it's caring. You know what I've discovered? That we pray for other people uh, as if we have pity on them. But when you are praying fervently, what it literally means is to pray as if you praying for yourself. Uh, I bet your prayer life will be a whole lot different if it was you in trouble. If it was your child that had to stand before the judge. If it was your husband that was in the hospital. Oh yeah, we pray for other people real cute. But when it's us, we gonna have tears in our eyes, slobbering all over the place, staying on our knees to make sure we get what we want from God. But they pray constantly and caringly. When is the last time you prayed for somebody else like you prayed for yourself? They prayed in fervor. Is their artillery. Yes. But can I tell you. Prayer. Will summon your ally. <laughs> yeah. Prayer. Is how. You get the attention. Of the one that's on your side. I, I told you earlier. That when you came to Christ. You had an adversary. That adversary is the devil. But can I encourage you that not only do you have an adversary, but you got an ally. You got somebody on your side that is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And when I pray, I call God into my situation. Watch this. Uh, yesterday, my oldest son uh, was moving from one apartment to another. Uh, he called me and said, Dad, uh, I need some help. Uh, of course, like a good father, I said, call your brother. No, no, don't laugh at me. He young and strong. Uh, I'm old and weak. It seemed like uh, the good thing to do at the time. I, I say, get with your brother and see if he can help you. Of course, the brother was at work. So, man of God, I had to go myself. When I got there, uh, he had uh, a, a dresser. Uh, about as long as the communion table. And, and, and we were bringing it downstairs. So, so we put something under it. And we let it slide down. I, I'm not the only one that ever done that. We let it slide down onto the dolly and then into the truck. Uh, but all the while, while we were driving to the new place, I was just saying in my mind, okay, we got it down the stairs, but I don't know who's going to get it back up the stairs. I, I done gave all my energy. I done gave all my intensity. I ain't got nothing else to give. But when I got there, what I discovered is that he had got on the phone and called two more people so we had some help. Oh, uh, y'all missed it. Can I tell you that whenever you call on Jesus, Jesus will give you help for your human situation. Here's what happens when you pray. When you pray, you will see the providence of God, the providence of God. The Bible says they're praying, but my text says on the very night that they were going to put him to death, that's when God showed up. Can I encourage somebody here that been waiting on God to move in your situation? You better trust the providence of God that at the very right moment, when you ain't got nowhere else to go, when you ain't got nowhere else to turn, when all of your money run out and you ain't got no friends to call your own, that the Lord will show up. I wish I had a witness here. You can't hurry God. You just got to wait. But if you trust him and give him time, no matter how long it takes, because he's a God that you can't hurry. But he'll be there, don't you worry.
presence of God. Is there a witness? When you pray, you'll also see the peace of God. The situation didn't change. But the Bible says while they prayed, Peter was in prison. He wasn't throwing a pity party. He wasn't walking around pacing the floor. But the Bible says that Peter was asleep in prison. I wish I had a witness here that could testify that when you learn how to pray, that God will give you peace, not in a storm that you're out of, not in the storm you're on your way to, but in the midst of your storm, the Lord will give you peace. Is there anybody here that folk are looking at right now, wondering how you're calm like you are, wondering how you're smiling like you are, but in the midst of your tribulation, God knows how to give you peace. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding to keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I'm going to my seat. When he prayed, he saw the providence of God. When he prayed, he saw the peace of God. But there's one more thing. When he prayed, he saw the power of God. Here it is. The Bible says his chains are loose. He's walking through the prison. But there's one more obstacle. The Bible says there's doors to the prison. And the doors are closed. I bet Pete was asking. When I get to the door, who got the key? When I get to the door, who's going to let me out? But the Bible says, when he got to the door, it was already open. Is there anybody here that can praise God for open doors? Then you ain't got to rack your mind trying to figure it out. Because my God already has it worked out. You ain't got to fight. For the Lord said be still and speak. The salvation of the Lord which he'll accomplish for you on this day. Is there anybody here that can testify that when I pray, I leave it in God's hands. For he's able. There's one more point. Prayer will result in your amazement. They were praying for people. But the one they were praying for was already at the door. He was already loose. And Rhoda said, wait a minute. The one we're praying for is outside right now. I, I love what they told them. They said, girl, you out of your mind. They were exactly right. Is there anybody here that knows my God? some stuff that'll blow your mind. He'll do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or even think. Find you a neighbor and tell your neighbor when I learn how to pray he blew my mind. He opened up the door. It blew my mind. When he turned it around, it blew my mind. When he made a way, it blew my mind. When I made it over, he blew my mind. When I made it around, he blew my mind. When I made it through, he blew my mind. Is there anybody here that can celebrate my God? Say yeah!
to fight a spiritual war. The greatest weaponry you have is the weapon of prayer. You, you don't need no hand grenades. You don't need no knives and AK-47s. All you need is a prayer life. You, you ain't got to cuss nobody out and be petty and try to manipulate things yourself. All you need is to develop a prayer life because your prayer can reach where you can't reach. Prayer will result in amazement. Put your hands together if you prayed and the Lord has blown your mind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe, maybe as the preachers take the floor, you're here today. And maybe you've been praying and those doors have not flown open yet. Maybe you've been going after God and Seems like nothing is changing. If that's you, and you're without a church home, you need somewhere to grow and to bloom and to be planted. You want to be like Peter. You want to be able to stand against the fiery darts of the devil. If that's you, we invite you to come this morning. Today is a good day to put your hands in the hands of the Lord. If that's you, just rise from your seat and meet us at the altar. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, sister. Father, I thank you for these, your servants. I thank you for bringing them back to your house of prayer. Thank you for putting Second Mount Olive on their mind. Father, thank you for, for the moment that uh, the man and woman of God have walked into this place. They've had the heart of a servant. That before I even knew the man of God, he called me and said, I'm coming to work. And on a Saturday morning, came in to lend his hand to the plow. Now, God. I pray, Father, that you would assign them to this ministry, Father, and create work for the man and the woman of God to do. I thank you now for favoring us enough that you sent them to be a part of this ministry. And we give you praise for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Just remain there for me. Just remain there. I will send them to her to get her information. And then we'll go from there. Amen. Amen. Just remain there. Amen. Amen. Let's begin to prepare our hearts and minds. 
sacraments for communion. Let's begin to prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for communion. The little boy went to the park with his parents and he got lost from his parents. And as night was coming, he found a police officer and told the police officer he was lost. The police officer asked him, do you know your address? He said, I don't know my address. He asked him, do you know your, uh, your phone number? He said, I don't know my phone number. He said, can you tell me something about where you live? He said, on my church, I mean, on my street, there's a church. And on my church, and on my, and at this church, there's a steeple. And on this steeple, there's a cross. So if you just get me to the cross, I can make it home. And there's one place every believer should be familiar with, and that's Calvary. It was at Calvary where he died for me. It was at Calvary where he set me free. The Bible says that he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, it is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after he had eaten, saying, This is the cup that is poured out for you, it is the new covenant of my blood. I also want to give the community our should be familiar with. Yes. One scripture every Christian should know. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son who so believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you think no one loves you I want you to know this morning God loves you. He gave his only son just for you. This way for represents his body, which was broken, eaten for you. Take, eat all of it. This cup represents his blood, which was shed for the remission of sin. Take, drink all of it. Tell them all, thank you. Let me speak a prayer over you. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. And all that believed and loved the Lord said, Thank God, thank God. and amen. amen. God bless you. You are this.